Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan, and on this episode, we are going back to my interview with Stephen Dewey, uh, because in addition to talking about Ten Candles, he talked a lot about a couple other games that he's been working on since then, and I wanted to find out what those were. So uh, so he's going to talk about it in this episode. Please enjoy. Uh, you know, since since Ten Candles, uh, sure. it, that's that's been a few years. Um, you did not stop developing games in no. any way, shape, or form. Uh, you've made several things, if I'm correct. I have. Um, some of them are, you know, out there on the internet for free. Some of them I've released through my Patreon for my Patreon backers. The other game that I have that's sort of out there for sale. Um, more or less at a complete status is a game called To Serve Her Wintry Hunger. Um, It is a dark fairy tale game where you play a quartet of snow spirits that have been sent out into the blizzard by your mistress, who is a yokai of the winter winds, uh, with the sole purpose of seeking out and hunting down a human that's gotten lost in a blizzard so you can drag them home for supper. Uh, It is fantastic fun. Um, Mm -hmm. It is, again, very much a dark fairy tale. The whole game plays a bit like reading a fairy tale. Um, It is also made for sort of one-shot sessions like Ten Candles is, but it plays in like at most two hours uh, with four players and one facilitator. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, so what are the characters uh, in in that quartet? Do I decide that on my own, or are there pre-gen characters? That there, you... are, there are sort of pre-generated characters. There are four spirits. Uh, you can choose between flame, cold, hunger, and fear uh, are the four spirit sort of mantles that you can pick up as your players. Oh. The mistress that you serve, her name is Yukiona, and that is an actual yokai of winter. Um, and mm. uh, flame is Yukiona's favorite uh and the most brilliant of all of the snow spirits cold is uh has recently found uh fondness in yukiona's eyes after a recent success hunger is being punished by yukiona for foolishness and uh fear is worthless and useless and horrible uh and the players will choose which uh spirit that they are playing And the game plays a bit like a race. It is a sort of a cooperative game, but you're rolling dice. You're trying to get ahead of each other in the hunt um, so that you can show off. Uh, You are also maybe taking pity on your fellow spirits if they fall too far behind, uh, exchanging them assistance, possibly extracting a wicked deal from them uh, in Mm. the process. You are bickering and arrogant and lashing each other, uh, trying to jockey for Yukiona's favor, which is a actual ranking that the spirits have throughout the hunt that can fluctuate and change. Um, And as you are rolling dice and proceeding with this hunt, Uh, You are also actually physically cutting out snowflakes, Um, much like in, you know, elementary school arts and crafts. You've got a piece of paper, you're cutting out snowflakes as sort of a marker for how you've been doing on the hunt. And then at the end of the hunt, uh, you either capture the human successfully or they escape. Both are potential options. Mm -hmm. If you capture the human, you are lauded with rewards and laurels by Yukiona. And you get to open up your snowflake, take a look at it, show it off, be proud. If (laughs) the human escapes, uh, you are forced to destroy your snowflake without ever getting a chance to see it unfolded. And it is tragic and miserable and gut-punchingly awful. Uh, But it should be. You should be ashamed for failing your wintry mistress. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, I take no responsibility. <laughs> uh, I should it, be allowed it, to open it and see the message. It is a lot of fun, uh, with, yeah. especially with like the right with the right group who really wants to just 
you know, pick on each other and make fun and sort of race and be arrogant little jerks um, in this dark fairy tale together. And it's fantastic to run, uh, especially for new GMs or people who have never run a game before, because you yeah. don't have to make a single thing up. You're literally just reading what is like a, the, the rule book is kind of like a script for you uh, oh. to read. So you just can sit back and read the text and, uh, you know, kind of you're kind of the rules uh, referee uh, mm -hmm. and the the narrator. And that's your job. Um, oh. so it's, you know, a nice short Excellent. game where you don't have to worry too much about improv or anything like that. You just read what's in the book. Beautiful. Okay. So I could run this. You could, and you should. Uh, okay, great. Yeah. <laughs> cause, cause all I need to do is I, I just need to read stuff from a book. I, I can, I can do that kind of GMing. There you That's go. the thing. <laughs> That's the yeah. thing I could do. <laughs> it's a nice, it's a nice small game. I think I'm selling it for like $15 on my website. Like maybe oh, nice. nine bucks for a pdf or something eight nine bucks for a pdf something like that oh wow so it's nice and it's a small little book um and it's the most fun you'll ever have reading through an rpg book it, it, you have <laughs> just as much fun reading it as you'll have running it it's a lot of oh fun. beautiful beautiful um what was the uh the inspiration that made you want to uh build that game well uh a another game designer jonathan walton who's done some really great stuff uh was actually taking uh submissions for a winter themed anthology of games that anthology sadly wound up going nowhere but i came up with the title first to serve her wintry hunger and the game spiraled out of me over the course of a day uh and then i've spent a lot of time reworking it but it was actually inspired uh, a large part of the actual structure of the game was inspired by the game the holly and the ivy by mcgay baker oh. which is uh, a fantastic game about hunting uh, an elk at dawn but it it functions similarly in some ways where you're rolling dice to see how the hunt progresses and it's a very light simple game i've sort of taken that basic idea and some of the uh, some thing, some inspiration from the mechanics and extrapolated it out into this larger uh, structure. But uh, a lot of its DNA can be found in McGay's game. So in some ways, we've gone from like 10 Candles, which is very much like a, a kind of a Halloween, like october -y kind of thing. And this feels definitely more like almost like a November. It's getting to be cold. It's the fallow season, <laughs> almost kind of RPG. Uh, I didn't I didn't superintend it. But yes, but, uh, <laughs> yeah. 10 Candles is very much a Halloween game to serve a wintry hunger can absolutely be played you know, over the winter. And then my newest game that uh, mm. I just had a Kickstarter for last year is re you can play it any time during the year, but it's a great springtime game. So it sort of okay. brings it full circle. <laughs> what's the uh, what's the one that uh, just finished the Kickstarter? So I had a Kickstarter for this game last year. It's called Gather Children of the Evertree. Um, and it okay. will hopefully be coming out early early to mid next year q1 q2 in 2020 um and it's very different from anything i've done before it is a card based um rpg slash live action role playing game um oh. but the the idea behind it is it's it uses a deck of cards and um the premise the story premise is that everyone who's playing uh, lives in this world tree called the ever tree, which is this massive tree and holds, you know, unknown number of people, all these little communities and villages and towns and kinships all spread out to the far reaches of its roots and branches. And you are a representative from one of those kinships that has come to an annual meeting of kinships known as the gather. And every year the gather is held. And where speakers from all of the kinships are invited to come and speak, uh, to share pronouncement, to share request, um, declaration, whatever you might, you know, knowledge, whatever you might be coming to the gather to share. Uh, and you gather here for this annual sort of meeting slash ceremony. You know, it's got a lot of the the sort of ritualistic DNA that 10 candles does, but it's a much mm. brighter game. And really when you get into the mechanics of it at its heart, it's a world building game. The structure of the gather is very 
mired in tradition and custom and sort of the way that it's always been done, which is not a very effective rule set for a meeting. Uh, but the premise being that on each of the cards in the deck is a question and that uh, there's no room for open discussion or questions at the gather. Instead, you can only sort of have the gather by asking the questions in the deck of the kinships that have gathered there. And then everyone in the, you know, in the assembled kinships answering those questions. Uh, and then from there, you can ask further follow-ups and sort of, of certain individuals that said something interesting that you want to follow up with. And through these questions and answers, you build the world uh, oh. around you. So as an example, you might, a, a question might be something like, how many among you still hold in your minds the songs of the river, which we must never forget. Wow. And everyone's going to offer a question an answer to that question. Yeah. And I might say none. And you might say all of us. Mm -hmm. Right. And I might hear you say all of us. And I might ask a follow up question. Why do you still believe there's power in those foolish songs? And then you'll answer that question. And as we're going back and forth, we're kind of building out who your kinship is and what they believe in and what's going on with these songs and why do you care about them? But I don't care about them. And right. we're sort of, so it uses uh, sort of very leading questions and the questions themselves kind of reveal a little bit about the world. And then the answers that the players all give sort of flesh out the parts of the world that are interesting to them. Um, hmm. So it's very much our characters that we're sort of, role-playing as they all of course know everything about this world that they live in but we right. as players don't so we get to kind of explore and learn about the world as they're talking about it in this strange ritualistic meeting uh you know a little bit like uh i i heard it described once as a fantasy model un a bit like we're all oh, right. sort of here with our own <laughs> interests and we're all trying to be diplomatic and we're following these very strict rules but as that's happening right. we're also sort of secretly all learning about this world as it unfolds before us as uh -huh. if we're kind of peeking into this meeting that's happening uh and being discussed I see. Now, in uh, my particular scenario, if I'm imagining all of the people at this assembly as Gelflings, does that make sense to you? Yes, of Be course. <laughs> okay, <laughs> because that because that's immediately what I think about. So now, one one of the fun things about the game is that the characters that are at this assembly are never really defined or fleshed out. Uh, the right. whole idea is that you aren't speaking as you, you are speaking on behalf of your entire kinship. So your mm -hmm. job here is very important. So there's no part of the game that's like character creation or anything like that. We don't talk about what the characters look like. So we might reveal, you know, you might have your kinship might be known as like the branch jumpers, right. Or something you might have named sure. them with. That's really all we have is the name of our kinship that you, that you come up with. And yeah. so I might ask you a question later in the game and I might ask how long have, has your kinship had wings? Mm. And then yeah. sort of, we all reveal of like, is your, is your kinship, are they birds? Are they like birds in the tree? Like, and everyone's right. sort of, no one's talking about that because we can't break the rules, but everyone's like, okay, wow, they have wings. That's so cool, right? And we sort of learn about, uh, we learn a little, we have the opportunity to learn a little bit about who we are, what's happening. Like we, I had a moment in a recent game I played through where halfway through the game, I pulled someone aside. And I'm like, are you guys just like spiders? Are you guys just big tree spiders? Because I'm envisioning, based on how you've been answering these questions, and they're like, see, I've been picturing that we just like are, are strange little sort of bugs. And I'm like, that's so weird. I picture you as giant spiders and that's okay. Right. Like it's okay for <laughs> you to have a different perception than someone else at the table. Cause it's never right. really discussed. It's a very personal game in a lot of ways because the way you see it and interpret everything would be very different from someone next to you. And that's actually okay to do. Right. Uh, because right. unless someone actually asks a question that locks something down as true, it's really not relevant. You know, you right. can just enjoy the game in any way you want. Sure. It's okay to be a giant bug or a giant spider, whatever right. you want. Right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and whether that's relevant or not, that that's not really important. Right. <laughs> like, probably won't even come into play. In that particular scenario, 
what, how did that development start for you? Uh, well, the, so in that, that specific one, I don't remember the exact um, questions and answers that had led to that, but I, I think that they had established themselves as being weavers very early on. Okay. Um, so that was sort of true. And we knew they had established that they navigated between the branches. And then they also mentioned, uh, someone had asked the question, a leading question about like their young jumping from the trees, from the branches. And oh. they answered like, oh no, that's fine. We have nets erected to catch them in case they do that so i was picturing like weavers nets yeah. like webs be, webs and yeah. like are these just webs you know and mm -hmm. i sort of so i was putting together that in my mind um you know and, and it never got really no one asked a sort of a forward enough question to confirm that sort of thing but it's a sort of this really interesting communal world building you know game uh where you can collaboratively work to examine the parts of the world that are really interesting to you as players uh and all the while building out this world um through this through these series of kind of like rituals and rules that really manage how conversation is even allowed to happen and who's allowed to speak when um so it's a lot of fun it, it's a very strange game but i think you know people who have have play tested it find it odd but really enjoyable in a way that you know they haven't really played anything like it before and it provides right. them with this unique sort of opportunity to play a, a strange fantasy world and build it out but not necessarily as like a map drawing game or anything like that and you're never really as you're once you start playing you're not really your player anymore you're really embodying this character sure. um, so you don't have a chance to like be out of game and ask people like so where do we get our water from or like where you know you're you're locked in it from the start uh yeah. and playing around with what you create and what you build in the game yeah when you said like oh fantasy un it's like yeah i've not i have not seen that before yeah. <laughs> that, that is definitely a unique experience when you, you were creating uh fantasy un how how did you start that development cycle what was the original inspiration to make that i had uh a couple pieces this was actually kind of a piecemeal game where i'd come up with i knew i wanted to make a game called gather and then i'd also independently come up with the idea of a game where people kind of talk over each other and it's a game about meetings and bureaucracy and you know trying to navigate that and i sort of independently had come up with the idea for like a world tree game um after some deliberation and everything just sort of came together it was a little bit inspired by so there's been sort of a recent surge of, well, this game has been in development for three to four years at this point, but mm. uh, even at the time there were some like card LARPs that had come out, like Jason Morningstar had put a few out there uh, of like games that were entirely contained in a deck of cards. Um, sure. And so I just sort of been tossing around a couple I ideas like that and the idea of a world building game really appealed to me. And this just sort of congealed from a lot of different uh, avenues of playing around with certain ideas. And I think there was just, there was a, a play test convention I was going to attend one year and I threw some cards together just as a quick idea, kind of ran it almost expecting it to fail, but it was met with some really great uh, feedback and excitement. And it just has sort of blossomed over the years and had a successful mm. Kickstarter last year as a result. Wonderful. So yeah, the Kickstarter is already over and done and, it and is. successful. Yeah, yeah it great. is done. So we're hoping to see the game actually out, you know, sometime 2020. But uh, because to serve for Wintry Hunger, sort of a smaller micro game, it's still, you know, in an Ashcan edition. This will really be my second big game, like full release game uh, right. that I'm going to be putting out there. So I'm really excited for it. It's yeah, it's lighter and smaller in a lot of ways. Like if you look at the word count between gather and 10 candles, gather is basically yeah. nothing uh, because it's <laughs> so driven by cards instead of a thick rule book. Um, right. But it, 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 it is so interesting and, and has so much depth to it in completely different ways. And it's been really complicated in a lot of different ways because I've never made a card game before. So this has yeah. been presenting new challenges and, um, but I'm really excited for it. I think it'll be great. Yeah. Yeah. Is, is there a way to legitimate, like, uh, what can I expect to do to actually win gather? Do I win at it at all? Or is it, is it not really that kind of a. 
it, of, it's of a game. game. It's a game where everyone sort of wins. It, it, okay. it, it has a happy ending. I like to think it has a happy ending, unlike, okay. you know, 10 Candles. Um, it's, yeah. it's positive. You sort of leave with, you know, you come to this meeting and sometimes the meeting can get intense. Sometimes yeah. it's revealed that factions, kinships at the table have been at war with each other. Sometimes it's revealed that kinships at the table will probably die out over the next year. Um, but it is a game about community and about yeah. making your voice heard yeah. within a system that might not really be built for that. And a sure. lot of, a lot of themes that I care a lot about. So I've, I've tried to make it sort of this, uh, you know, so that you'll go away from it being like, Hey, that was a really beautiful game. And like, I'm glad I got to, we got to spend time together doing that. Cause that was really nice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. As yeah, opposed yeah, yeah. to 10 candles where you're like, I need like a couple days. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. We, uh, t- 10 candles. Uh, everyone pretty much dies. And, right. and then, then the, the game that you followed it up with, uh, somebody wins, but everybody else is horribly disappointed. Yeah. And now, and now, and now, everyone can walk away somewhat happy, <laughs> somewhat, somewhat happy, or at least you know, it, it's a when when the game is over, it's really about you know, okay, we've done this, we've built this out a little bit, and now yeah. we can sort of go forward into the next year a little wiser, a little more prepared. So it's about looking forward, you know, looking back, but also looking forward and uh, really about pushing forward and, uh, and making things work. Those positive themes that you do get from gather, which I'm, I'm really fond of. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, I will be looking forward to seeing that uh, when it releases. Uh, but now here's the thing that I'm want- like, obviously, you know, if anyone who's out there listening, you know, you, you could play any of these games at any time of year. You're, you're perfectly able yes, to do that. I give you permission. You have Stephen Dewey's permission to play any of his games at any time of year. You do not mm-hmm. have to wait for a specific time. Um, but it does make me start to realize that if we kind of equate them to seasons, your next game is going to have to be about summer. It and, will uh, be. Okay. Okay, good. Maybe. I don't know. Who Maybe. knows? Maybe. It's going to be about swimming. <laughs> <laughs> or, or gardening. I do, I do have a couple garden. ideas for games that will be coming up. Uh, none of them are super seasonally based at the moment, but who knows what will happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. What I need is uh, I need a game that's based on uh, the click clock wood stage from Banjo Kazooie. <laughs> so just one that I can go between four seasons and things I do in one or, you know, influence the next. I need that game. I think that's no one's going to make it. <laughs> I don't think. Yeah, I think. You know what? Here's what I always say to that. If you really want a specific game to be made and you really don't think anyone's going to make it. You, you have, have to. to make it. You got to yeah. go forward and make that make that dream become a reality, my dear. Yeah, yeah. No, no one wants me to make games. It's just going <laughs> to, you know what my games are going to end up looking like? It's going to look like if you made Mousetrap, but half the pieces are missing. <laughs> That's pretty Fair enough. The game. That's pretty quintessential of everyone's Mousetrap experience growing <laughs> up. So. Yeah, there's, there's most of it is just, uh, is just gone. So, but uh, hey, you know, everybody had fun. That's, uh, that's the only thing that the mouse certainly did because it got away. Yep. We've talked about the individual games, but when you're developing a game, what are some of the uh, main things that you're really looking to achieve, like for, for a player experience in each of your games? Well, the, the specific experience widely varies, but I think, I think that that you sort of answered it. It, it, What I'm looking for at any game design is for the player to have a a specific experience. And I think that that, um, you know, just the idea of that isn't as straightforward or as, you know, as obvious as it may, may appear to be. It, It really, I think takes attention and focus and kind of having a clear idea of what you want to build a system, build a game setting that will provide players with not just the, you know, experience of going through it, but the emotional experience and the um, sort of overall experience that you're looking for them to receive to to enjoy as part of any game right. and uh you know so that's what i'm looking for in all my games i when i when i come up with sort of a general idea i i have to take a you know take a break and think okay what 
experience am I going for? Well, how do I want the players to feel? What do I want them to take away from this, you know, at the end of the session? Um, mm. And then how can I build mechanics and rules that will support that specific uh, kind of experience I'm looking to, to engender with the player. So uh -huh. it can, it can really vary. You know, there's not, there's nothing specific I can really apply across all of my game ideas except that i want you to feel sure. something uh and i want it to be you know pure and powerful and evocative and to leave you thinking about it uh you know even after you've finished playing i don't hear that very often but i do like that as a concept that you're you're talking about what you actually give players as the experience before you even start building the game itself yeah uh yeah i i, I do like that Always think about what your care. If you want them to be scared, or if you want them to think snakes, well, now you know pretty much what your game is going to be. <laughs> yeah, exactly. If you want them to scream snakes, and that's the reaction, well, then there's probably going to be snakes in your game. Again, this is why I don't develop games. <laughs> it would just be snakes and ladders, but the snakes are real. <laughs> hey, I'd buy it. <laughs> endorsed by Stephen Dewey. I'm very happy about that. <laughs> uh, anything else that you'd like to discuss before we wrap things up? You can find uh, pretty much all my games online, uh, cavalrygames.com or through my Patreon, patreon.com slash Stephen Dewey. Uh, even a uh, sort of a external playtest version of Gather is out on my Patreon right now. So if you're catching this episode early enough and want to play that game right now, you can actually do that uh, over on my Patreon. Beautiful. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, so go and uh, check that out, and we will make sure to leave uh, links in the description of the episode. I want to uh, thank uh, Stephen for coming back on the show, and uh, and uh, and uh, I'm sorry that Alex uh, missed out on it, but you know, snake curse hits him every couple years. So. These things do happen. No worries at all. <laughs> I'm, I was happy to be here. Absolutely. Um, he, what happened is he got an early version of my live snakes and ladders game. And now, oh, I see. Yeah, that's, uh, well, you know, live and learn and then get a new co-host because apparently he's going to be down for a while. I don't know. Um, but uh, but thank you very much. Um, if, uh, if people wanted to catch you online, uh, not just at the website, but uh, mm -hmm. in any other kind of social media capacity, uh, where could they find you? Uh, probably best to find me on Twitter at Shifty Ginger. That's where you can find mm -hmm. me on Twitter. You can find him right there. Uh, you can also find all of our stuff over at DelveCast.com. Don't forget to check out our Patreon so that you can see all the longer, extended, uncut episodes before I go and actually edit them like a professional. Uh, but also, uh, to uh, make sure to check us out online, uh, I am at Citanium, Alex is at EXP Limited, and the show is at Delve Podcast. And you can find the show on basically... Every known platform known to mankind. Uh, iTunes, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio. You can find us everywhere. So please rate and review and subscribe. I really like that. And if, uh, if I get uh, under five stars, that's my version of Ten Candles. I'm watching <laughs> the stars just <laughs> click out of existence. Don't give me that sensation, folks. Don't make my stars go away. <laughs> That's the uh, that's the podcaster's version of Ten Candles. There you go. He's watching your star ratings go down. You don't <laughs> want that. You don't want that. Uh, again, I want to thank Stephen Dewey for coming on, uh, scaring me uh, to no end, and uh, giving me hope for the future. That's that's what the new games are. I'm getting exactly. more hope. Exactly. Perfect. Excellent. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for having me. And uh, for all of us here at Dell, thank you all for joining us, and we will catch you on the next one. Bye, everybody. Bye.